So I have given a comparatively vaster topic, uh, a vague topic. I will try to finish in 15, 20 minutes because it's the discussion which needs more time, the case-based discussions. Uh, and reproductive endocrinology uh, is a area in itself. Uh, there are textbooks on that. Uh, we know thyroxin acts directly uh, through its receptors. Uh, the thyroid hormone receptors are found in ovary, uterus, placental tissues, and other reproductive areas. And it also has got indirect effects, mainly through the estrogen, progesterone, and other growth factors. So it's a kind of a multitude of effects, uh, as seen in this BC slide, where it tries to incorporate all the effects on various uh, reproductive organs and the placenta in terms of uh, the direct and indirect effect. We should remember that uh, thyroid is an exquisitely controlled organ from the feed forward and feedback mechanism from the hypothalamus, the thyrotropin releasing hormone, which controls the pituitary release of thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. The hormonal alterations in thyroid disorders, again, uh, the, the list is extensive. So if you see, it can affect estrogen, progesterone, LH, FSH, and also the binding globulins. And uh, thereby, both uh, the excess and uh, the deficiency of thyroid hormones can have effects in a myriad of uh, areas. Thyroid disease in India, the landmark paper, which was uh, discussed by um, Dr. Nikesh Shenbar, uh, it has found that uh, almost one in 10 adults have hypothyroidism subclinical or overt hypothyroidism. And it's significantly higher in females, 15, almost 16 percentage in females versus 5 percentage in males. So it's quite prevalent in India and the, that's why we are discussing this on this World Thyroid Day, the effect of this in uh, females. So right from menarche in terms of uh, the pubertal disturbance to menstrual irregularity, to infertility, to pregnancy and menopause, uh, thyroid disorders have its role in, 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 in the lifespan as, of a female. But we know uh, the, the phase of accelerated growth, which is mainly mediated by growth hormone, is equally mediated by thyroid hormones. So in hypothyroidism, uh, there is a growth retardation. It's actually the reversible cause of short stature, which is still being uh, picked up, uh, even though with talk about thyroid tests being done, still I'm sure we see hypothyroidism as a cause of short stature and fortunately picked up early, it, the child would grow to a normal stature and adult. So the delayed onset of puberty is, uh, is the usual presentation, but we should always uh, bear in mind uh, the atypical presentation of isosexual precocity, that is development of breast and internal genitalia in girls, but with the absence of pubic hair development. So a child coming with telarchy with or without galactoria has uh, even have a menarche, but absence of pubic hair development. And the characteristic feature of that, uh, hypothyroidism being the cause, is uh, it be the child being short. A normal precocious puberty or the usual precocious puberty, we expect a growth spurt, but uh, the contrary here, the child would remain short. So that's the most important clinical clue. And fortunately, if it's picked up early, most of these changes are reversible and there are reports of large cystic ovaries and untreated hypothyroidism uh, getting spontaneously normalized with uh, thyroxine supplementation. Menstrual irregularities and hypothyroidism, I needn't go to uh, details about um, this. Uh, you are more aware of this. Uh, the various abnormalities it can have right from amenorrhea to excess of bleed and abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, the studies have shown uh, various prevalence rate uh, if you see, this is a review article almost a decade old, but still um, uh, it, it divides into early and uh, recent studies. So early studies, maybe three decades older, uh, had high prevalence. Later studies were probably the pickup rate of thyroid disorders is high. Uh, the prevalence rate is lower. How hypothyroidism affects menstrual cycles, it's again related to the hormone changes. Uh, the prolactinemia, hyperprolactinemia, which is uniformly seen in hypothyroidism, is mainly due to the hypothalamus-driven TRH. So this would, uh, any increase in prolactin levels, you know, will uh, play havoc with the GnRH pulsatility. And uh, that would result in ovulatory dysfunction and uh, altered LHFS ratio. 
the high serum TSH level also has got some spillover effect on the F FSH receptor. So this would again uh, produce prob problem in ovulation. Hyperthyroidism also has got effects. Again, the GnR pulsatility. Other effect of hyperthyroidism that we should remember is uh, the effect on the hepatic SHBG production. So the factor eight and the coagulation pathway also get affected. That's why uh, the, the commonly it's menorrhagia which uh, can happen and this can be troublesome. Uh, so it's not only linked to the thyroid hormone, but the, uh, the coagulation uh, problems in severe hyperthyroidism. Thyroid and polycystic ovarian syndrome, again, two disorders which are uh, uh, very common. Uh, they actually, they are the most common endocrine disorders after diabetes, uh, thyroid disorders and uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Even though the etiopathology is completely different, they have many features in common. And the common link uh, probably is uh, the obesity, uh, the central adiposity and insulin resistance. Um, we know BMI, high BMI is found in majority of polycystic ovarian syndrome cases almost 50 to 70 percentage, but still even the uh, so-called low BMI has got severe insulin resistance and any amount of uh, visceral adiposity and insulin resistance is associated with increased pro-inflammatory markers, increased uh, 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 other inflammatory markers would actually decrease the deadness activity in the pituitary, which leads to a slight increase in TSH. So the slight increase in TSH is again part of uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome and many a times it can have an overlap with hypothyroidism also. The ovaries in hypothyroidism, again, uh, they become polycystic in appearance uh, due to various factors, the role of increased prolactin and increased TSH. So the uh, prolactin because of the ovulatory dysfunction, it can have a polycystic appearance in the ovaries. Increased TSH due to uh, the spillover effect on the FSH receptor, which can lead to increased collagen deposit in the ovaries. So the ovaries become multi-systemic, multi-cystic, uh, similar to the polycystic appearance. Uh, there is a role of autoimmunity also, uh, uh, the autoimmune thyroid disease being very common. Autoimmunity is increased in polycystic ovarian syndrome also. As such, uh, the effect of estrogen on uh, the on the uh, lymphocytes and uh, T cells and macrophages is said to have a role and altered milieu of these hormones would play a role in, uh, in the autoimmunity in PCOS. So there's been studies, worldwide studies, which have shown that autoimmune thyroiditis is more prevalent in polycystic ovarian syndrome. And these patients with autoimmune thyroiditis and PCOS have got a, a rather a peculiar phenotype of having less uh, hyperandrogenic features but more of metabolic features. So there may be uh, less of hirsutism and other uh, hyperandrogenic features, but they are more have a, they more they have an elevated uh, metabolic risk. So the metabolic risk of uh, cardiovascular disease and other problems are more in these patients with associated polycystic ovaries and autoimmune thyroid disease. This is seen in uh, studies from India. Also, this is a uh, study from Arnold Institute, which has shown that uh, the prevalence of uh, polycystic ovaries in patients who have autoimmune thyroid disease, youth thyroid autoimmune thyroid disease is very high, 46.8 versus 4 percentage. So these, uh, uh, these uh, girls have high BMI, waist circumference, systolic blood pressure. Again, and hyperandrogenic features were lesser in these uh, patients. So uh, there is a pathway which links uh, adiposity with increased TSH and also autoimmunity. So there is that's why probably the uh, prevalence of autoimmune thyroid disease is high in polycystic ovaries. And uh, this pathway is centrally mediated by leptin. Uh, the adiposity increases leptin and can have an effect on the autoimmunity. That's uh, a postulation. So we all know the need for screening in, um, for thyroid disorders in polycystic ovaries because it's, uh, PCOS is considered as a diagnosis of exclusion, and we need to screen the TSH and uh, prolactin and also 17-hydroxyprogesterone. The guidelines, uh, the ESHRE uh, guidelines also recommends uh, the exclusion of uh, thyroid disease uh, before uh, branding them as uh, pure polycystic ovarian syndrome. Thyroid and infertility, I think uh, some of these aspects were already covered by Professor Jabbar. Uh, the ovulatory disturbance, uh, which again is uh, central in thyroid disease, uh, the GnRH pulsatility, the high TSH, high prolactin, uh, the spillover effect, 
the decrease SHBG, uh, the hormone blinding, so the androgen excess, which is apparent, all these produce ovulatory disturbance. And uh, we also need to look into the male factor. Uh, the sperm is also kind of influenced by the uh, hypothyroidism in the male. So uh, that's also one of the things which we need to look into. And uh, the recommendation uh, is very clear. Uh, TSH concentration uh, rec evaluation is recommended uh, in all women seeking care for infertility. Regarding thyroid autoimmunity, again, the same study of uh, Dr. Onikrishnan has shown high prevalence of thyroid autoimmunity in India, 21, almost 22 percentage is the prevalence rate of anti-TPO antibody. And females have shown higher prevalence and females of the age group of 46 to 54 has got the highest prevalence of anti-TPO antibodies. This assumes important in terms of the menopausal age group where uh, this can unravel uh, septic hypothyroidism in these uh, females with uh, anti-TPO antibodies. Effect on thyroid dysfunction and autoimmunity and fertility, we have, uh, I think, uh, discussed this uh, large uh, uh, correlation between anti-thyroid antibodies and uh, infertility. So we have seen that thyroid autoimmunity is more prevalent in women with idiopathic subfertility and polycystic ovaries. And uh, the prevalence of thyroid autoimmunity, even in the youth thyroid stage, is associated with diminished ovarian reserve and premature ovarian insufficiency. So this, this can have an implication when you are trying for ovulation induction and uh, uh, need to keep in mind with the age of the patient, they can be having uh, premature ovary insufficiency. And there is an inverse correlation between the TSH level and AMH. So this would uh, go hand in hand. Infertility, again, uh, because of uh, the high prevalence uh, of autoimmune thyroid disease in infertile women, uh, the various associations, right from uh, the result to the procedure, can have an impact. Uh, in terms of autoimmunity. This is said to be mediated by interleukin-2, high interleukin-2 levels, which activates the NK cell activation. Basically, the milieu of autoimmunity and probably an inflammatory milieu, which leads to uh, the ovary dysfunction and uh, results of that in autoimmunity. What about subclinical hypothyroidism in infertility? Professor Jabbar had already alluded to some of these aspects. Uh, levothyroxine treatment is found to have uh, an, a better delivery rate, better outcome uh, when you treat this. And the thyroxine supplementation is to be recommended to improve pregnancy outcome in women with septic hypothyroidism and thyroid autoimmunity undergoing uh, artificial uh, reproduction techniques. So meta-analysis have been very clear about this. Uh, subclinical hypothyroidism and thyroid autoimmunity should be given levothyroxine supplementation. Oxy recommendation is also uh, uh, clear in this regard. Uh, the aim of treatment is to keep a TSH of less than 2.5 when you are uh, women are undergoing IVF or XC. And in euthyroid antibody positive women undergoing uh, replacement um, artificial uh, fertility techniques, there would be uh, given levothyroxine treatment, uh, considering the potential benefits comparison uh, with the minimal risk. This is a guideline which I think uh, Professor Jabbar had already alluded to. That it's very clear about how to go about with this. So as part of uh, the subfertility workup, I need to measure TSH and uh, thyroid peroxidase antibody and or thyroglobal antibody. When you have either of these antibodies, when you have a TPO antibody, there is no elevator, then you need, need to measure thyroglobal antibody. But if TPO antibody is normal, you can measure thyroglobal antibody and because that has got important treatment decision implication. When the TSH is more than four, whatever be the antibody status, you need to initiate levothyroxine treatment before uh, starting ovulation stimulation. When the TSH is between 2.5 to 4, if either an TPO antibody or thyroglobin antibody is elevated, you need to start levothyroxine and uh, check TSH after uh, ovulation stimulation. If the antibody is negative, then you need to start. Between 2.5 and 4, you need to start. But you should check the TSH after ovulation stimulation. And if it goes above 4, then you need to treat. If the TSH is suppressed less than 0.3, 
then uh, you, you may be looking at uh, hyperthyroidism, measure free T3 and free T4. If it's normal, then you can watch. If free T3 or free T4, either of them are elevated uh, or decreased, because uh, elevated means hyperthyroidism, decreased means you're dealing with probably a central cause, either a pituitary or hypothalamic problem, and it needs expert uh, uh, evaluation probably by an endocrinologist. The last part, thyroid and menopause, uh, again, because uh, thyroid dysfunction is common above the age of 50, and because of the fact that thyroid symptoms, mainly hypothyroid symptoms and menopausal symptoms can be very similar, fatigue, depression, mood swings, sleep disturbance, um, they, they can go kind of, uh, they can miss it. So other important aspect is that if you miss it, untreated thyroid disease may actually exacerbate the risk of increased osteoporosis and increased cardiovascular disease, which have uh, seen in uh, postmenopausal women. So that, that's why we have guidelines uh, which recommend um, uh, the ATA, the American Thyroid Association guidelines, uh, recommend screening of all adults above 35 years of age. They are very proactive in terms of uh, the recommendation of screening for thyroid disease. If it's normal every five years for subclinical hypothyroidism, the ACE recommendation is that older women should be screened, probably in the perimenopausal age. The ACOG recommends screening of high-risk women with family history of thyroid disease or autoimmune disease from autoimmune thyroid disease from the age of 20 years or onwards. So whatever, when the when you have a uh, family history, when you have uh, minor symptoms also, you need to screen, especially in the menopausal age group. Regarding treatment, if the age is less than 70 and the patient has symptoms and TSH is more than or equal to 10, uh, definitely you should start treatment. But if it's more than 70 years and uh, if the TSH is more than 10, uh, you can consider treatment. If the age is more than 70 years and TSH is less than 10, that's where uh, you need to aggressively start treating these patients. Because studies have found that above 65 years, uh, TSH of up to 10 may be considered as normal part of aging. So more than 70 uh, years of age, less than t uh, TSH of less than 10, uh, unless uh, you are sure patient symptom can be attributed or the, you have other issues like uh, goiter, uh, then uh, you can wait, uh, do thyroid function test every six months. And if the TSH crosses to more than 10, probably you can start treating. Uh, abnormal uterine bleeding in perimenopausal age, again, um, a thyroid dysfunction has to be ruled out. So screening with thyroid function test has to be done in these women. So take home, uh, we have seen the thyroid diseases are very common in India and uh, the disease have uh, significant effects on the gynecological disorders right from conception to menopause. And with appropriate screening and high index of suspicion and prompt management, uh, the risk of uh, the gynecological disease can be reduced in these uh, patients. Thank you.